Hi, Monica Melpass, and welcome. We're going to be talking today about Acurex Pharmaceuticals, and President and CEO David Lucci is here. Great to have you with us. Uh, they do specialize in making drugs that prevent deadly infections in hospitals and nursing homes, a key problem that we do need to uh, continue treating. Now, you do treat a lot of difficult bacteria. Tell me what are in your R&D pipeline at this point, some very key items. Yes, so our R&D pipeline includes a novel uh, first-in-class antibiotics that treat gram-positive bacterial infections, including some of the highest incidence infections in America, C. difficile, MRSA, and PRSP. Uh, MRSA itself is 52% of existing hospital-based infections mm. in the USA today. Wow, it's obviously critical to preserve public health uh, because there are urgent threats, as you just mentioned, uh, and then some that are classified as serious threats. So what do you have for each of those angles? So uh, serious or life-threatening infections are obviously the key need with antimicrobial resistance. Our first antibiotic candidate, Abezapulstat, uh, which is in clinical trials for C. diff infections in phase 2b, uh, at least for the next couple of months anyway, um, that lead antibiotic has already been designated as a qualified infectious disease product by the FDA and fast-tracked, and that's because, by definition, it's a serious and life-threatening infection that it's treating. Um, now, the World Health Organization just came out yesterday uh, with a pre-meeting from their Copenhagen conference um, on uh, antimicrobials, and they've said that there's a dire need for new classes of antibiotics that treat serious and life-threatening infections um, because the existing bacteria morphs its properties to avoid being killed by currently marketed antibiotics. They don't work anymore. Mm. We need new antibiotics and there's three million people a year in the U.S. that have these serious and life-threatening infections with less and less antibiotics out there that can effectively treat it. Right, they grow resistant, obviously, people know that, but just to remind them. Uh, but the FDA approval process is not easy. It's rigorous, you have a big R&D expense that's involved. Uh, yes. And what I've re read is that the approvals actually have dropped from 29 to just nine uh, or even seven in some years. How do you get through that quagmire? That's a lot of red tape to try to muscle through. It's a lot of red tape for sure. And you know what it involves is a 10 to 12 year process that starts with drug discovery. Our drug was discovered at UMass Amherst by uh, two research scientists. We bought it back in 2018 and have taken it five years. Mm. And right now we're just about to get done with phase 2B. We expect very good, uh, I should say excellent data uh, with an early termination, we think, uh, sometime in the, the coming months. Um, and then we move on to phase three, which is the final phase. And then you file for FDA approval. Okay. So we're nearly home. Phase three, it would be prime time um, for an antibiotic because everyone will be watching because they'll know that if our data is good that we're going to have a marketed antibiotic. In our case, we think it, it will be a frontline therapy, billion dollar a year product. Oh my goodness. Well, drug resistance is a widespread obstacle. Why is that? Uh, drug resistance is widespread because there has been a dearth. There have been a lack of new classes of antibiotics to be approved. See, what happens is bacteria when they recognize the antibiotic as medicine, they morph their properties to avoid being killed by that medicine. So we need an absolute inflow of novel antimicrobials uh, to replace the old ones, like oral vancomycin, the standard of care in C. diff. Mm -hmm. It's 60 years old. Mm. So that will no longer be used for C. diff if uh, a product like ours continues with the data we've seen so far and gets approved. It will no longer be on their recommendation list. So what we need to do is, as public health is get an entirely new class, uh, a series of new classes of antibiotics out there to treat bacterial and fungal infections. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Pasteur Act aims to uh, incentivize. It's a pull incentive, much like one that's approved in the UK where basically the governments around the world are presenting carrots. So that, uh, the uh, market value of your program, once FDA approval or UK approval occurs, you will get a check from the government for the value of the program mm. to help incentivize hedge funds and other money managers to put money back into antibiotics. Instead of making what's currently happening, they're making more money in early stage oncology companies, oh. diabetes companies. So it's, it's to level the playing field. So we're big proponents of the Pasteur Act. And uh, we think that that would go a long way to make sure that 
uh, public health is served. The WHO just yesterday, in advance of their Copenhagen conference, um, they, they, they call it the uh, silent pandemic. Mm. And they say that it, there's an urgent need, and the CDC has agreed. Wow. Well, historically, uh, the number of approvals was really big. We made big advances after World War II in the 1950s, just ginormous. Yes. Uh, but there was a drop off after the 1980s. Any chance now, 40 years later, we could uh, reverse that and go back to big discoveries and be on the cusp of something really exciting? Well, in order to do that, we have to get these pull incentives approved in the U.S. like they are in the U.K., mm -hmm. and they're being considered throughout Europe by the European Congress. Um, we're going to be on a panel, our chairman, uh, Bob DeLuccia, at the European Congress in Copenhagen um, on, in, on infectious disease. That panel discussion is April 8th to 10th, and they're going to be discussing ways to incentivize companies to bring novel antibiotics to market. It's the innovation that has to be incentivized. Otherwise, we're going to be back to a pre-antibiotics era right. where people are going to be dying of bacterial and mm. fungal infections for lack of medication to treat them. Mm. Goodness. Well, if you do get FDA approval, how would that change the treatment paradigm? If we were to be FDA approved uh, based on the data that we have now, if it consistently holds through phase three, uh, we're certain that we would be frontline therapy based on what's out there. Um, and that would, that, would that would push fidaxomycin permanently into last line therapy. That's a Merck therapy. Um, it goes off patent in 27 anyway. Um, and it's not qualified infectious disease uh, product uh, designated. Um, vancomycin would go by the way, uh, by the wayside like metronidazole before it. Um, and then after front line, there's a question of what else would be used. Uh, series uh, therapeutics and several others have down the line microbiome related treatments, which would only be used in uh, patients who have had a relapse. Mm -hmm. So far, we haven't had any patients with a relapse, so I don't know how big that market would become okay. if we were approved, but I, I think that's what would happen. Pfizer and Sanofi, for example, they were going to be, uh, uh, they, they were working on a vaccine. The vac in each case, the vaccine failed in phase oh. three. Oh, no. So unfortunately for them, you know, that didn't work out, but you know, the seas have parted and we have a real opportunity at front line because there's not a lot left in the, in the uh, pipeline. Mm. Well, how many more patients would you need to enroll so that you could accomplish your goals and get some early uh, termination of the PH2B uh, trial? We need only 11 more patients. Literally 11? Literally 11 wow. more patients. And we're pre-screening five to seven patients per week huh. at our 28 trial centers. So we're right at the cusp. Um, and if, th if that last 11 patients works out, our independent uh, medical uh, advisory board will look at the data and give us a recommendation, hopefully we think, to early terminate the study instead of continuing to enroll patients. Mm. At that point in time, we meet the FDA to design phase three, and next year we start the phase three trial. Oh my goodness, what an exciting time. Uh, but there is quite a bit of competition in this field, and how do you sort of work your way around that and continue to do the, the good fight for consumers? Well, there is competition in, in the field, um, but you know, it, basically if you have great data, which we're fortunate enough, thank God, to have, um, it, it really sets you apart from other things. Uh, other things that are being used for C. difficile, you know, down the line from frontline are fecal transplant related programs, uh, microbiome related programs to restore the healthy microbiome without any effective antibiotic medication going with it. Mm -hmm. They're, they're kind of one-offs that would be down the line, so they're not even really directly competitive. Um, so it's really given us an opportunity to take a small amount of money and a small amount of patients and get right to phase three where it's prime time. Right. And then, you know, meet Maximize that. that. Exactly. But it does require a talented team of researchers and scientists. How do you attract and retain people like that? We're fortunate enough to have an executive chairman, Bob DeLuccia, who's been in the industry since 1972, mm. uh, starting with Pfizer. He's gotten a number of antibiotics approved. Um, he rose to the level of uh, president of uh, Santa Fe North America. He's been in pharmaceuticals for 50 years. Wow. Um, so he really is uh, a source based on all of his contacts over time where we're able to pick up uh, people like Joe Scuderi on our board of directors former vice chair of uh, Johnson & Johnson Pharmaceuticals. Terrific. Uh, Fred Hassan is a corporate advisor to us, uh, and he, he, he listed on our website. He's a former head of uh, Shearing Plow before okay. it got sold right. to Merck. Absolutely. So all of these contacts really come through our executive chairman. 
Wonderful. All right. Well, President and CEO David Lucci, what a pleasure to have you, and we wish you continued success at Accurex Pharmaceuticals. Thank you, Monica. It's a pleasure to be with you. Okay. Thank you so much for watching.